Hello, and welcome to the first in our Bite Size series on the Data Act. We are going to be getting into what it means for organizations and what benefits it, it might offer. Um, in our first uh, video in the series, we're going to get into some of the concepts and the purposes for the Data Act. In our second video, we'll get into a bit more detail on the data access and sharing obligations. And then our final video, we'll talk about the switching provisions. Um, so I am joined today by my colleague Vivian Spees and our technology and innovation group. Um, so Vivian, it would be helpful just to start with getting an overview of the Act. Thanks, Kara. And yes, of course. So we probably don't appreciate the vast quantities of data that are generated by users' use of connected products. Mm -hmm. And when I refer to connected products, I mean um, Internet of Things or IoT products. And this is from consumer products all the way to industrial equipment. So at its heart, the Data Act is about increasing competition by using the value of data across the digital supply chain. For example, it will facilitate competition in aftermarket services. It will incentivize and standardize the widespread sharing of both personal and non-personal data mm. from IoT products. And it will also reduce friction when consumers want to change cloud services. OK, that's helpful. So in this series, I think we're just going to focus on the data access and sharing obligations and the switching obligations. But there's a whole lot more in the Data Act. So are there any other kind of areas that you'd like to highlight? Yeah, so there's a lot in the Data Act and certainly more than we can cover in this series. Mm -hmm. So for example, while we in this series focus on provisions on B2B and B2C data sharing, mm -hmm. there are provisions in the Data Act which mandate business to government data sharing in certain instances of extreme need, like a pandemic or a natural disaster. There are also provisions relating to interoperability of cloud computing services. I know we'll be getting into more detail in the second video, but it would be helpful just to have a summary of those data access and sharing obligations that you mentioned. Yes, so um, in short, users, which can be both consumers and businesses mm -hmm. have the right to request certain data from connected products. And they also have the right to request that this data be shared with third parties in certain instances. So maybe an example would be helpful. Let's say I buy a smartwatch. I can ask the maker of that smartwatch to provide performance data of the watch to a local electronics maintenance company so that they can fix certain performance issues I've been having with the watch. Now, the data we're talking about here is raw but usable data, which is picked up by sensors in the product. Mm -hmm. So this would be uh, metadata, including, for example, timestamps. Equally, I could request the data relating to my interactions with apps on the watch from the relevant app provider. OK, that, that makes sense. And that's quite a powerful, right? Um, so uh, but. But as far as I understand, those rights don't just apply to consumers and consumer products. Uh, they apply to businesses as well. Yeah, so they apply in the B2B context too. So uh, perhaps another example would also be helpful here. Uh, so let's say there is a factory offer operator that might lease machinery uh, that is used to build widgets. Now, the manufacturer of the machinery would need to make certain information about the product, its performance, and its environment, and how to use it available to the factory operator on request. Alternatively, alternatively though, the manufacturer may choose to make this data directly accessible to consumers via uh, designing open interfaces where um, consumers can directly access that data of the product. Now, I won't get into all of the data sharing obligations in the Act, but suffice it to say that there are also certain rules around the, the request sharing and the use of this data. OK, uh, so there's loads there for our second video yep. um, to talk to about in more detail. Um, but we might do a quick summary of the switching obligations so everyone's kind of familiar before we do our uh, third video. Sure. So uh, the switching provisions relate to any data processing service, which is essentially any cloud computing service. This would include infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. In short, if a customer wants to change from an old cloud service provider to a new cloud service provider, the old cloud service provider can't frustrate them from doing so, for example, by restricting termination, uh, implementing long notice periods for termination, or restricting unbundling. 
Also, as part of this move to frictionless switching, switching charges will eventually be eliminated. The original provider will have to port any data and digital assets to the new service provider or to the consumer themselves if they're moving the service in-house. And ACT also requires that cloud computing service providers make available, free of charge, open interfaces that facilitate switching. Okay, so again, there's a lot in that too. I mean, that's going to have a huge effect on cloud providers because it essentially is creating an automatic termination, right, I suppose, if you want to move um, as a customer. But we might switch gears from the substantive obligations and just talk a little bit about the mechanics. Um, so how is the Data Act going to be governed or enforced? Of course. So the Data Act provides that each member state will designate a competent authority. However, given the sheer breadth of the Data Act, it's very possible that member states may designate more than one competent authority, in which case they'll also have to appoint a data coordinator which will act as a single point of contact. The Data Act also establishes the European Data Innovation Board, which will function somewhat like the EDPB does uh, with the GDPR to ensure harmonized enforcement. And then of course, the DPC will remain the regulator for processing of personal data in Ireland. Okay, that's helpful. Um, now, in terms of disputes, of which <laughs> I'm sure there will be many, um, how will those function under the Act? Each member state will need to appoint a dispute resolution body that um, users can choose to use. Uh, when it comes to issues like compensation for B2B data sharing and trade secrets, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's going to be absolutely no shortage of disagreement. Mm -hmm. And of course, then um, users, which like we've said, can be businesses or consumers, can choose to seek effective remedy in the courts. Access the courts. Okay. And then I suppose our uh, final question, um, or topic is just in relation to timing. So there's obviously a lot in the Data Act. So the question is, how long do we have uh, to achieve compliance? The Data Act came into force 11th of January, 2024. And from today, it will become effective in less than a year in September, 2025, when the data access and sharing obligations kick in. However, some obligations will only apply later. So direct access and design requirements won't apply until September 2026. And then switching charges won't be fully elim eliminated until January 2027. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you, Vivian. Um, it's really great to get that overview before we get into the detail, particularly because there is so much in the Data Act. Um, I just want to thank you for joining us um, and please look out for the next video in our series and we're going to get into a bit more detail on the data access and sharing obligations.